It's a plot for quantum electron wave functions of an isolated silicon atom. As you can see clearly, the tightly bound core electrons in atoms are associated with wave functions with a shorter wavelength. Actually, not only the core electrons, but also the valence electron, that is 3s, its wave function near the nucleus is also of shorter wavelength. Now, these oscillations actually often become comparable to the value of the cutoff energy that is generally taken in nowadays depth calculations. And hence, the chance of getting error increases. To include those oscillations, the cutoff energy should become much higher and definitely the computation cost would then have increased proportionally. Obviously, scientists have developed tricks to bypass this particular problem and the method to do so is called the pseudo-potential method. Once upon a time, well, maybe not that ago, but long before the emergence of TFT in 1916, Lewis had shown that the valence electron will be most sensitive to the changes in the chemical bonding environment, while the core electrons, that is, which are located near the Coulomb singularity, will be relatively immune to such changes. And obviously, now it's an well established empirical fact, too. Well, not only that, also, if you look at the electron densities, that the valence charge density peaks at a radius corresponding approximately to half the silicon silicon bond length in silicon, while the core electrons are localized near the nucleus. Hence, more or less, even the charge densities peaks at different points for different types of electrons. That the core electron density is negligible where the valence electron density is large and vice versa. Therefore, there is actually no reason that we cannot separate these two types of electrons. And we should be able to perform DFT calculations by keeping the core electrons as they appear in the isolated atom. That is, the properties of the core electrons are then fixed in all the subsequent calculations. They are not actually changing, right? This approach is called the frozen core approximation. But does it really help? Let me give you an example. In case of tungsten, we have total 74 electrons. Guess how many electrons are needed to be described with frozen core approximation? Well, it's only six electrons. Hence, clearly the frozen core approximation leads to a substantial computational saving. That was good. But the next question then becomes, how do we decide which wave function should be considered core and which ones as valence states? As a rule of thumb, in the context of DFT calculations, the term valence corresponds to the outermost shell of the atom in the periodic table. For example, for tungsten, we would have 6s2, 5d4. However, there are cases where one might need to include more electronic states in the set of valence electrons. For example, in case of bismuth, it is important to describe on an equal footing both the nominal valence shell 6s2, 6s2, 6p3 and the semi-core shell 5d10. In practice, the distinction between the core and the valence electrons is not a strict one and depends on the level of accuracy that one is trying to achieve. When in doubt, an inspection of the spatial extent of all the atomic wave functions might help. Take this figure, for example, by looking at the spatial variations of the electron densities, we can easily distinguish the core and the valence electrons. Still, if in doubt, you can definitely just mail me at thrtclcmp at the rate gmail.com or you can ask your respected supervisor. Okay, now once we got the idea of the deciding factor of which electrons should be considered as the valence states, the next question becomes what is the procedure for eliminating the core electrons, right? For a start, see carefully. Near the nucleus, 
to a state changes sign that is it exhibits a node in the region where one s state is localized and now come to 3s the 3s state changes sign twice that is it exhibits two nodes so that the overlap integrals with the 1s and the 2s state vanish maybe i should become more careful here see the wave functions that are having such nodes are actually the visualization of a quantum mechanical phenomena all of you must have read that the wave functions are mutually orthogonal that is exactly what is happening here that's actually why to preserve that particular property of the wave function they do exhibit the nodes let me show you one see the integral of overlapping of 2s and 3s is zero from the picture itself right you can try the others and also for other materials on your own and it's really fun to do so okay let me go back to tft see if we simply ignore the core states then we will also lose the information about the valence electron wave function in the core right but also one fact is that too if we try to obtain the correct oscillating features of the valence electron wave functions in the core then it would be very difficult to describe them using a real space grid that we have obtained by introducing the energy cut up since the wave function of the valence electron itself is highly oscillatory near the core the representation of these oscillations would be very poor using the grid that we have agreed upon and thereby it will underestimate the accuracy and the numerical stability of the calculations here in this picture you can see actually how the wave function would look like using the grid that originates from a lower energy cut up of course one way out here is we may try to fix this issue by using a finer real space grid or in other words a higher energy cut off but the sole purpose of us is to reduce the computational cost by using a lower energy cut off right so the main problem that is arising here is because of the high frequency of the wave function near the core or more technically speaking more the nodes of the wave functions less will be the accuracy if the grid spacing remains constant i hope that is clear to you up to that point no confusion is there i guess therefore what we will do here is we'll replace the real wave function by a smooth and nodeless curve in the core region as shown in this figure you can clearly see the representation of the wave function actually this one has a particular name the pseudo wave function however the representation of the pseudo wave function is quite great with the same number of grid points now right but then what is a pseudo potential the question still remains right the pseudo potential is actually the potential which is plugged in into the schrodinger equation will provide the pseudo wave function as a solution or simply the potential associated with the pseudo wave function is called the pseudo potential mathematically if we call the pseudo wave function as up and the pseudo potential as pp then the schrodinger equation will be minus h square by twice m d square dr square up of r plus pp of r up of r equals to ep of r into up of r or we can also say bp of r equals to ep of r up of r plus h square by twice m d square dr square up of r whole divided by up of r or finally bp of r becomes simply ep of r plus h square by twice m d square dr square up of r divided by up of r by the way as we have said earlier also one may also choose not to use the pseudo potential and then that calculation will be called all electron calculation but this is rare most of the dft works nowadays are carried out by using pseudo potentials ideally a pseudo potential is developed by considering an isolated atom of one element but the resulting pseudo potential that you have got by the calculation can then be used reliably for this atom in any chemical environment 
without further adjustment of the pseudo potential. This desirable property is referred to as the transferability of the pseudo potential. Current TFT codes typically provide a library of pseudo potentials that includes an entry for each at least most elements in the periodic table. I feel you are already having a sense that now you are quite smart fellow in TFT. You may feel smarter then by knowing that there are different types of pseudo potentials. The details of a pseudo potential essentially define a minimum energy cutoff that should be used in calculations in which the atoms associated with that particular pseudo potential is involved. For example, I am opening a pseudo potential file for you. See here, minimum E cut rho and minimum E cut WFC is clearly mentioned for that particular atom. Similarly, for all other pseudo potential files, there remains the suggested cutoffs that should be used in the calculations. Now, pseudo potentials requiring high cutoff energies are said to be hard pseudo potentials while more computationally efficient pseudopotentials with lower cutoff energies are called soft pseudopotentials. The most widely used method of defining pseudopotentials is based on the work by Vanderfield. These are called the ultra-soft pseudopotentials or USPPs. As we can guess from their name also, these pseudopotential files require substantially lower cutoff energies than alternative approaches. One disadvantage of using ultra sub pseudo potentials is that the construction of the pseudo potential for each atom requires a number of empirical parameters to be specified. But guess what? If you are going to use a DFT package and you are not in the research of developing pseudo potentials itself, you don't need to worry about this particular disadvantage. Current DFT codes, which you are actually going to use, typically only include ultra substitute potentials that have been carefully developed and tested. But they do, in some cases, include multiple ultra substitute potentials with varying degrees of softness for some elements. Another frozen code approach that avoids some of the disadvantages of the ultra substitute potentials is. The projector augmented wave or PAW PAW method that was originally introduced by Blockel and later adapted for plane wave calculations by Krishi and Jobert. Krishi and Jobert actually performed an extensive comparison of ultra sub pseudo potentials, PAW, and all electron calculations for both small molecules and extended solids. Their work shows that the well constructed ultra sub pseudo potentials and the projector augmented wave method give results that are essentially identical in many cases. And as importantly, these results are in real good agreement with all electron calculations. Though, in materials with strong magnetic moments or with atoms that have large differences in electronegativity. The PAW approach gives more reliable results than ultra sub pseudo potentials. Now, one example of a hard pseudo potential is a norm conserving pseudo potential. As the name suggests, it tries to keep many norms of the all electron wave functions unchanged, or it respects the norms of the all electron wave functions. For example, the total charge of the all electron calculation and the calculation that is using a norm conserving pseudo potential is identical. But that conservation of norms comes with a cost, a higher cut of energy. Even if just one atom in your calculation is hard, a high cut of is required. This translates into large CPU and RAM requirements. That's why ultra-shaft and PAW pseudo-potentials are much more popular. Though, while doing optical calculations, it is always advised to use the norm-conserving pseudo-potentials. In my description box of this video, 
I am providing some really good websites for getting different types of pseudo potentials. Okay, thank you all. I believe that this lecture had been quite long enough, but also you have learned many things here, right? Okay, let's meet again in our next video. Thank you. Thanks a lot.